Hey there, gang. Can you stomach one more neck reset? It's a different kind again today. Um, I think I've gone through just about all the different iterations of neck resets in the last month. But this one's a Martin, so it should be easy, relatively speaking. Neck resets aren't ever easy. They always pose a bit of a threat. This is a triple O M from, I think, around 2004, 2005-ish. I haven't looked it up, but it's got a serial number just over 1 million, which Martin surpassed in 2004, the old memory banks tell me. So I'm extrapolating. The M series, I think it's also called the Road series, were an attempt by Martin to compete with the higher level Asian imports that were arriving then, while still retaining production in Pennsylvania, so they could call it a US made guitar. These have laminated mahogany back and sides with a solid Sitka spruce top. Simple binding scheme, not too fussy satin finish. So they could come in at a price point that would meet those slightly upper end Yamahas and Takaminis and that kind of thing. Probably the most important concession, at least for us at this juncture, is these have got a mortise and tenon neck joint in them. It's ostensibly a cost cutting measure, but in reality, fitting these necks to the body is only moderately less time consuming especially for the pros in the Martin neck department. Like, they can put together a dovetail pretty quickly. Uh, maybe it's just expectations from the public, you know. The dovetail speaks of high craftsmanship, and they didn't want to put that on a guitar they were selling for less, that kind of thing. This guitar comes to me from a local music store. They need to get it tuned up before it goes on the wall. It's had a crack in the top, which has been previously glued. There are a couple of cleats in there as well. Overall, it's in pretty okay shape for a 15 year old guitar but the action has gotten a little bit high not outrageous but enough to make it kind of unappealing if you've got a bunch of them in the store there and you're you know picking them off the rack and trying them out with similar guitars so the action is just over 7 64ths on the bass side and about five and a half on the treble so eh, it's medium high borderline i would consider that high action some people would think it's okay on necks with bolts in them, Martin disguises the fact using a small laser embossed plaque thingy affixed to the front of the neck block. Other makers often use a sticker for this, which is, yeah, it's a little bit cheesy, and sometimes they come off cleanly if you want to do work in there, other times they don't, and sometimes unscrupulous people will jab a hole right through and it looks real ugly. Looking at the neck with string tension on it, we can see that this straight edge, which is resting on the top of the frets, contacts the bridge at a point below its top surface. That usually means it's getting towards neck reset territory. In extremely bad cases, it'll actually be touching the soundboard. We can measure that gap and um, compensate for the effects of string tension. So I'll check and see. Look here and see that at the front of the bridge, the um, straight edge is resting approximately seven millimeters off the top of the soundboard. And I can take that measurement again after removing the strings and see what it does then. The other way to do it is to use a jack under the bridge on the inside of the guitar to hold it and maintain this shape as it's in now when you take the strings off it. I don't usually find that necessary. I just figure the difference into my calculations. And to be honest, at the end of the day, I'm really just looking at this straight edge when I'm doing the actual reset to see where it is in relation to the bridge. And that tells me where I need to be. There's also a gap at the end of the heel this could be caused by a number of things. It's possible the bolts have loosened over time, or rather the neck block has shrunk a bit with age, uh, leaving a gap there so it's loose and not pulled up tight against the body. It's also possible that this area of the heel has warped away from the body, like we saw in that old J45 a couple of weeks ago. So the goal is of course to have that fit snug. I have a special palette knife which I've bent with a propane torch which will help pry the plate off the neck block. It's probably held on there with really strong double-sided tape, and this will help. After some wrestling, here's the plate. It's made of maple, and this is kind of thick and spongy stuff, sort of like processed cheese. There's the hidden prize. It's just one single Phillips-headed screw. So we'll get after that with a stubby screwdriver mess up our knuckles a little bit. The fingerboard extension is glued on like you'd find in any standard Martin. So I'll heat it up like I usually do, take the palette knives to it, but surprisingly that didn't get me very far. 
I pulled and prodded and wiggled, but the neck would not budge, and I started to have a sinking feeling. I think this mortise and tenon is glued fully in place. So here comes the heat, out comes the 15th fret, in go some holes for my resistance heaters. These work pretty well on white glue, the stuff that they use in these guitars, but if this whole joint was glued, it would be a problem. I had budgeted about three hours for this guitar. I got that joint good and hot. I let the heat really soak in and it's you know well over 200 degrees Fahrenheit in that neck joint right now. Um, if this was a standard dovetail I could just pull it out with my hands. But in this case there's so much surface area holding on. I couldn't pull it out but I could actually push it in. Oh, that's really interesting. I noticed something. With that glue being warm and supple, I could pull the heel back up to the body and the straight edge lines up with the top of the bridge and a hair more, just exactly where I want it to be. Um, the glue is really stiff and difficult to move, um, but I want to put a clamp on it as it cools down just to make sure it stays in that position. So this is a rather frustrating introduction to these Martin bolt-ons. I didn't realize that they are fully glued mortise and tenons which I've mentioned before can be a lot more difficult to disassemble than a regular dovetail because you have to overcome exponentially more surface area and push it a much greater distance before the parts come apart. The times I've done it have required multiple bouts of heat and steam and a lot of force. Not what I was expecting. So rather than making things quicker and easier and less expensive to repair, this bolt-on is at least as complicated to remove as the standard dovetail and possibly more. And so the gray area where it makes financial sense to do this is shifted several hundred dollars up the scale. This would not be a cost that I think most people would absorb given the value of these guitars. I thought they were like an old school Taylor guitar from the 70s and early 80s, which makes sense, you know. If you're going to do a bolt-on, just let the bolt do the work. Perhaps there is a tonal benefit to doing it this way, but it's, I don't know, debatable. In this case, the system they came up with was failing. The sad thing is the adhesives they use, most manufacturers use them, they're thermoplastic, and the parts can creep under tension if it's left in a hot car or something. If the screw became loose due to the neck block shrinking a bit, that gap gets transferred to the outside of the guitar and the angle's ruined. This is one of the reasons I use the wave washers when I do those bolt-on conversions, because um, they compress and provide constant tension against the possible contraction of the uh, neck block. And in th that case, it's not even super necessary. If things get loose and the heel lifts up, anyone with a screwdriver can get in there and snug it back up. But with this system, you could turn that screw till the head broke off and not solve the problem you're not going to overcome the mechanical advantage of the glue. So the screw is really just a remnant of the assembly process. Once the glue is on there, it's pretty much useless. There's one other thing in this design that really bugs me. I think it was a time-saving measure, but it just seems way too risky. They've cut the neck block back at an angle so that there's limited contact where it meets the surface of the back. What we mean when we say the neck has come up is really the neck block inside there has tipped forward under the string tension, taking the neck with it, folding the guitar, and causing distortion in the top and back plates. I think this might give that whole process a real head start. You know, it takes a while to sand a matching angle or radius into the blocks, and in traditional classical instruments, um, they overcame this with the slipper foot. Those old guys were really concerned with creating a buttress against that folding force. And it's the reason that, say, flamenco builders can get away with those paper-thin tops. That folding force is transferred to the upper transverse brace and spread out to keep things rigid. This cut-back block here, this has the opposite effect. You know, they're relying on the stiffness of the sides to carry all that load and they're actually providing an open hinge for it to move in, so it doesn't make sense to me. So I'll reinstall the screw with the wave washer this time. Luckily the uh, 
countersink hole is just big enough to allow that washer in there. Again, with the glued on joint, this really has little effect other than sort of taking up space and acting as kind of a last ditch measure against the effects of overheating. I'll make some shims for the fingerboard extension. These don't have to be very thick in this case, just about half a millimeter at the end. And I'll glue these with hot high glue because it's resistant to creep in a way that modern carpenters glue isn't. I've got to get that clamped up pretty quickly. And clean up the squeeze out. I'll make a replacement saddle out of bone. I like the way bone sounds. I prefer it to the composite materials, but to each their own. Everyone has their preference. Here I'm rounding the ends to fit the slot. I want the fit to be snug, but not too snug. Just tight enough to lift the guitar. Ugh, this shot again. Radius sanding block, do your thing. I can measure the height of the saddle above the surface of the bridge and guesstimate how much extra height there is and what I can safely remove with the jeweler's saw so I don't have to sand for too long. I usually get this within about half a millimeter. My bore holes were the same width as the fret, but they snuck out one side a little so I need to fill that in. I'll wax up a strip of veneer to keep the slot clear, put some more wax on either side, and then pack in some appropriate colored wood dust. Then drip in some thin super glue, let that dry and sand it. And then I can hammer in the fret again. Wax off again and wick some more glue along each side of the fret to hold it. I need to do a little bit of leveling in the upper reaches. It's time to reinstall the cover plate. I'll put on two layers of tape to cushion it against any irregularities in the surface of the block and trim off any excess here. All right, all back together. That wasn't very much fun. I'm probably not going to make very much money on this one, but you know, live and learn. I keep telling you guys that I'm not really an expert, you know, and these aren't tutorials as much as they are explorations. I gained about a 32nd of an inch in saddle height, which is good. It's now about 3 seconds of an inch high with decent brake angle. That's acceptable. The action is, to be honest, just a touch low. It's a skosh below 5 64ths on the base side, lower than 4 on the treble, which in a shop situation might be too low. So this is one of those instances where I actually overshot my mark and sanded about 15 seconds too long. It happens. So tomorrow I'm probably going to make a slightly taller saddle. I don't put shims under a saddle. People might ask that. I don't mind them under the nut if they're done properly, but it's not good for the sound to shim a saddle, so I wouldn't do that. Besides that, it plays fine. You know, it's bright. Feels like a Martin neck. Doesn't sound like a standard Martin, but plays okay.